Day three of the lockdown in three states and reports of both police brutality and acts of violence perpetrated by the citizenry have been circulated. Could this be due to the manner of the enforcement of the lockdown? And a tweet by the Ministry of Finance, Budgeting and National Planning asking billionaire Elon Musk for ventilators as Nigerians questioning the government's readiness for the fight against the pandemic in Nigeria. This is Plus Politics and I am Benny Ark. Some individuals worshipping at the mocks in the Agege axis of Lagos State have allegedly attacked some officers of the Lagos State COVID-19 Task Force who have been trying to enforce the lockdown imposed on Abuja, Lagos and Ogun State. This report is coming amidst reports of violence and manhandling of citizens by security operatives trying to enforce the lockdown. Are these occurrences taking place because of the manner of enforcement being adopted? Is there anything we can do concerning them? And joining us now to discuss this via phone is legal practitioner Taiwo Akinlami. Thank you, Taiwo, for joining us on Plus Politics. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start by asking, how did you feel when you first heard about this report, this happening? About the... The, um, the attack on the task force who were out there to enforce the law of staying at home, the lockdown. What? Um, we have heard one side of the story. My training is that I must hear both sides of the story. The side that we have heard is the side of the government. We have not heard the side of the religious people. Why did they gather? What were they trying to do? Were they trying to supply food? Were they trying to reach out to their people? We are not aware of, um, of the real facts of the situation. It is important that we take whatever we are hearing from, news, from newspapers and from government with some pinch of salt. So but, but what I would say is that if it is true that that happened, I would say that that is not commendable, that is not right. It only means that those religious people need a level of education. They need to be informed. They need to be taught, to be aware that whatever measure that government is taking, is for their own good and uh, so basically that's that will be my re immediate response okay now what, what factors do you think could could be responsible for the attacks on these enforcement officers um could you blame it on illiteracy or religious extremism what could it really be well um you see this is a very tense period neither the religious people nor the government have gone through this kind of experience before the last time our world witnessed this kind of uh, situation was was um, in 200 years ago. What you talk, the Spanish flu. So we've never seen this before. Everybody is trying to understand. Everybody is trying to grapple with it. So we have to be careful how we condemn people. We have to be careful how we are hard on people. Government needs to be careful. The people need to be careful. For example, I was hearing one bizarre thing by a government of a particular state saying that people should not meet if they meet, that they are going to acquire their property. And I said, why do you talk like this? If you meet and if, if anybody holds any meeting, is there any law in your state that says the next thing is to acquire people's property? So we need to be careful. This is a third world country. People are going through a lot. People are trying to wrap their minds around these happenings differently. Now, you can't compare those who have the resources to stock up food at home, you know, even for one year, to people who cannot even stock up food for one day. So these are realities that we need to be careful about. We need to explain things to those who do not understand. And I do not, I do not also want us again to make it a religious matter. It could have been any gathering. Because what I understand today is that when, even when the Lagos State government came out with the executive order that, me, that there should be banning public meetings, and meetings should not be more than 20, 
It was first 50, first 50, then later 20. Eighty yeah. percent of religious organizations in Lagos complied. So we should, we should commend that. So I don't know why this is making headways because if it's ma ma making headline, because if it is that religious bodies come together to say that they are not going to follow the government's instruction, then you can be new. You know, because you see, government also has not handled this situation perfectly. And we are, not, we are not knocking them. So also, other people in the society who are trying to respond may not handle the situation perfectly. So we just need to be careful and handle things uh, uh, and, be, and be careful with ourselves. All right, you, you didn't mention while you were speaking, we have some privileged Nigerians who, if this lockdown should go on for a period of one year, they have nothing to worry about. Now, we can't say that for certain for every Nigerian out there. Which makes me to ask, so you think the secession order was pretty much abrupt by, by the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which affected Lagos State, the Federal Capital Territory, and Ogun State uh, as a whole? Do you think it was pretty well, much brash and abrupt? Well, uh, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, there was something happening in Lagos State. If you follow the, the chain of events, since this since the, we recorded the first case and we had some other cases and the Lagos State government began to take steps, there was a way things were being done. So, so we, we, the president came after he bowed to the will of the people to address the people, after, it was, after many campaign and after many agitations. He finally woke up and felt the need to address the country. And in addressing the country, his defenders have said they were trying to gather facts. He needed data. Now, having gathered data, uh, within 24 hours, Lagos was on lockdown, was going to be on lockdown, uh, Okun State and Federal Capital Territory. Yeah. Now, the point I keep making is this. What plan did we put in place for the viewers of wood and draws of water? The Oipoloi, the people that have been regarded as the wretched of the earth, people who live on less than one point nine dollar per day. That is the that is the record of the world poverty clock. That Nigeria has the highest number of poor people. That is Nigeria has the highest number of people living in extreme poverty. We overtook India. India is 1.3 billion. And let me quickly say that this idea of lock lockdown was carefully followed by CNN yesterday in India. There's lockdown in India. But the poorest of the poor are jobless because they live from hand to mouth. They earn daily wages. They are not only jobless, they are hungry. The, the, that, that report went further to say that over 74 million people were living in dirty populated area. So the if it is like that in India, and there's a similarity between us and India, the challenge is that we are facing the same situation here. And you know the conclusion of that, the conclusion of that report? It is that social distancing and all of this lockdown will not work with poor people. Okay. Because there's another plague, which is the plague of hunger. It's more vicious, it's more virulent, than the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, Tawa, this is it. Still, still on the cessation order. Uh, many people have argued the fact that before the president um, passed down the order, remember there was also a, a similar order by the Lagos state government, um, which was supposed to take effect from the hours of 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Later, they rescinded on that. Uh, many, yes. people, many people argue the fact that the executive governor of Lagos State, Baba Jide Saolu, was on top of the matter and that they feel that he was not duly consulted before the, um, the secession order and the lockdown of Lagos State by, by the pronouncement of the president. What, what are your contemplations on this? Well, this is my thinking. I, I don't know what happens in between government. Uh, the Saolu government is the same from the same political party with the federal government, so the same party. The, the challenge we see here, if there is lack of coordination, it is the way we govern in Africa. It is the way we govern in Nigeria. Now, I, I wrote in my blog yesterday, asking the critical question, that number one, if you say you want to give food to 200,000 families in Lagos State, it is not enough. It will be nothing but tokenism, except 
you show us the data you are working with. How many families need food? If you say you want to forgive people and empower money, you want to give them 10,000 ahead or 5,000 ahead. The question is, how many Nigerians are on that list? 86.9 million Nigerians are living on less than one dollar per day. Less than 1.9 million dollars per day. Dollar per day. So uh, what statistics are we working with? In every nation, where there is stimulus, there is a data. There is a statistic. But what we are used to here is media abacadabra. What we are used to here is, is grandstanding, is pop media publicity. For you to come out and show us some people that we are giving money. In any sane and developed country, did you see anybody in the U.S., in, in Britain, in Italy, lining up to collect five dollar or one dollar? This money is going to be sent to them. The activity of human beings is going to be protected. We keep using the word the poorest of the poor. And I said yesterday that Nigeria does not have underprivileged people. You know, you know, because for you to say somebody is underprivileged, it means all his or her rights have been met. What has not been met are privileges. What Nigerians are denied of are food, shelter, health. Those are basic things that they are, uh, they are denied of. Those are fundamental human rights that the Nigerian society to. So it's not enough for you to reel out empower plan, for you to reel out feeding families. It is enough for you to tell us categorically how many families need food. Yeah. How many of them are we able to feed? What kind of support do we need? These are fundamental issues because for me, hunger is a bigger, bigger, bigger pandemic than COVID-19. COVID right, right. Even before the advent of COVID-19, people are already hungry. There's already food crisis. Not to talk of now. So, it, so I think that we cannot take policy decisions that does not represent the welfare and the security of the people, which shall be the prime member of government. All right. Now, like you rightly said, before the advent of COVID-19, we also didn't know that our uniformed men have um, found themselves in a situation whereby they, they innocently harass innocent citizens. Now, there have also been reports of soldiers who have been violent with people, and this has been seen during this period. Now, due to the fact that even before this pandemic, the issue of police brutality was very much in existence, do you think this time, given the peculiar situation of this, of, of the, of this pandemic, Will these security operatives be reprimanded or will they just go free as usual? Okay, as, as I said in some one of the pieces that I've written in my blog, I said that crisis come to reveal us. Character is not built in the time of crisis. Crisis comes to validate a people's character, who you really are. So the challenge is we have a state where the dignity of human person is not in the front burner of government concern. So since the, since the welfare and the security of human, uh, the welfare and the security of the people and the dignity of human person is not in the front burner, it reflects in every strata, every structure of governance and functionality of government. So it is not, when, when the, you, you, you look at the, the Northeast, where there's Boko Haram problem, there are allegations that military officers do uh, uh, mess up, mess up, mess up people there, and so it is the nature of government. It is the nature of the relationship between the governed and the government. So for me, uh, what we need to call attention to is that there's no situation, there's no pandemic that will make it legal or make it acceptable for you to treat people as cons, for you to treat people as animals. No matter what has happened, we still have to respect the dignity of human person. The constitution has not been suspended. And so there's no reason why the military or the police should, should exert brutality on the people. All right. Now, some people have argued the fact that um, the government, the federal government, should have gone a different way in um, using the military to enforce um, the lockdown order. 
how do you react to this? Because to every to every war, to every war, there's a rule of engagement. And so yeah. to this lockdown, there should be a rule of engagement. The use of military to enforce in this law. What's your reaction to it? Well, as I've just said, there is no rule of engagement that will excuse government in terms of respecting dignity of human person. Now, now the, the president in his address, which I listened to carefully, did not tell us the rules of engagement. But it is taken for granted that the rule of engagement should be as enunciated and enshrined in the Constitution. No matter what you do, we must respect dignity of human person. If somebody is not supposed to be on the road, and the person is on the road, and the person is not offering any essential services, the person could be arrested. And if the person is arrested, arrest does not mean you throw away the dignity of human person of, of, a, of a citizen. So those are fundamental issues okay. that is important that we bring to the front burner of every conversation. No matter what has happened, as I've said, the government is not going to be perfect. The people are not going to be perfect. But what I've found is that government has a way of understanding its own imperfection. But we do not understand the imperfection of ordinary citizens. It cannot work that way. Okay. You are not perfect as a government. I want us to excuse you. And you tell us we have not seen this situation before. And you tell us you are trying to do your best. Even when we do not completely agree, you, that same measure that you, that you argue with, you should also confer, confer on citizens. If religious organization has to shut down and 80% are shut down, I think that is commendable. Okay. If people are asked to stay at home and the majority is at home, and I think that is commendable. The government, the way where it's commending itself, should commend the people. That's very important. All right, you know, let's, um, Taiwo, let's look at the, the legality and the, constitution, uh, the constitutionality of, of the lockdown. Um, many people feel that in the first place that we're peculiar people. And do you believe that this lockdown came at the right time? And given our peculiarity, uh, we're, we're people who are not used to, to obeying laws, except at the end of the day, force is used to, to enforce the, the, the obedience to this law. Let, let, let's look at the constitutionality and the legality of this lockdown, if it, if it did come at the right time. Okay, first, first, let me quickly say to you that Nigerians have the culture of obeying laws. It is just that those who make the law are not an example for Nigerians. You know, because if lawmakers obey the law, then you will see Nigerians obeying the law. When you will live in a country where it's a matter of who you know, not a matter of what you have done, there's no example at the level of leadership this is a country where court orders are flouted with impunity. This is a country where budgetary allocation or budgetary planning are not followed and there's no explanation to the people. This is a country where House of Red people told us that we should buy make in, made in Nigeria and they're not going to accept no son car and they still have to import their cars and they, have to, they still have to receive it in the midst of this pandemic. I'm telling you, sir, the problem is not with the people. The problem is with the example that those who lead the people show. That is, that is it's important we state that. As for the constitutionality yes. of what has happened, now there are many schools of thought, there are many arguments, that what the federal government has de declared is a, is a state of emergency. And the federal government should have consulted in line with the constitution with... with um, with the National, the Assembly, National Assembly before making such order. The people on the side of the federal government has also argued that there's doctrine of necessity. The president was dealing with an emergency. Whichever way, my own position is this. Whether it is legal or is legal, whether it is a, 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 a demanded by emergency or not, the fundamental thing is this. Is it in the best interest of the people, the welfare, and the security of the people shall be the problem of government. Now, when we sit down to look at what has happened, is it in the best interest of the people? And I will answer this way. One, Africa or Nigeria is not ready for COVID-19. COVID 
Don't let us deceive ourselves. Develop democracies. Develop economies. Who have working health system? Who, ha who which our leaders here run to are in trouble. They are not able to talk. Not to talk of Nigeria. If our health system is that powerful and is working, why do our leaders go out of this country to treat to treat ordinary broken knees? Why do they go out of this? Why do they go out of this country to treat airdrum sick infection? Now, so it means that we are not ready. No matter what we are being told, there are there are like 500 ventilators all over Nigeria, and according to a report by Nigerian Medical Association, all those 500 ventilators are already occupied. 350 intensive care units. Where do we start from? So I think the strategy of government must be to prevent COVID-19. COVID Prevention is the, is the best strategy for Africa. That is why I'm not against the lockdown. That's number one. Number two, so, and if there's going to be lockdown, there must be provision for those who cannot take care of themselves. Taiwa Kinami, legal practitioner, thank you very much for joining us and for your insightful contributions this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break, and when we return, a tweet shows and shows the stress in the minds of Nigerians as regard the preparedness of the government to fight against the coronavirus pandemic. We'll be right back. <laughs>